Well, good afternoon and welcome to the session, Income Inequality, Human Capital and Growth. I am Grigina, if you speak Lithuanian, or Chris, if you don't, Keeley. I graduated from the college in 63 and uh, received an MBA in 79 with interesting time in between. I'm also a member of the Alumni Board of Governors. Our organization represents the alumni community at the University of Chicago, and we serve to advocate the interests and needs of our alum population globally. Our, our goals are, again, to raise the profile of the alumni community, to be available uh, to them as a university and its resources as they uh, travel through that uh, sometimes rocky road of life. Uh, whether it's career or other kinds of interests that you want to pursue, uh, the university does have resources and we would hope that we're able to advocate and make them available to the alumni population. The Alumni Weekend is one example of uh, that effort. And if any of you attended the Alumni Recognition Program this morning, you know we, uh, do, a do, we do a formal presentation acknowledging a talented, accomplished alumni and students who are about to become alumni. But this afternoon, we are going to be hearing from uh, Professor Kevin Murphy. Now, when you come to the University of Chicago, many of us come thinking we're geniuses because that's what we have been before we came to the University of Chicago. <laughs> And then very quickly we discover that it's loaded with geniuses and some of those geniuses we can never aspire to, to reach their level of accomplishment. Professor Murphy is one of those geniuses. He is the single faculty member uh, at the University of Chicago and I think anywhere else if I'm correct, having received a MacArthur Genius Award. So we're not only proud that he has come to talk to us uh, with his accomplishments and knowledge about the world of income equality and other things associated with human capital and growth, but we are very pleased to have him here to answer your questions, hear your comments. Um, for the most part, uh, uh, if there's a clarifying uh, question you have during the presentation. Of course, uh, Professor Murphy is glad to respond, but we do have time set aside at the end of the program for general questions and answers. So having said all of that, I'm not going to go on any further, and I'd like you to welcome Dr. Kevin Murphy. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for the kind introduction. Um, definitely overstated, but I'll take it. Um, anyway, well, and thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm going to talk to you about a topic I'm sure everybody hears a lot about these days. It's one of the, one of the leading topics uh, on many agendas right now in terms of income inequality. And I'm going to take a very, uh, not surprising, economic approach to thinking about it. And, and I'm going to focus some on the consequences, but probably more on a perspective that I've developed over time on a lot, what's been going on and try to tie it into uh, sort of broader economic phenomena. Hopefully when you leave here, you'll actually realize that it's probably a more general phenomena and a, and a broader phenomenon than you might have thought coming in, but maybe you'll also think about it slightly differently than, uh, than the way you, when you came. So I'm actually going to start at a somewhat different place than most people when they start talking about inequality. I'm actually going to look at inequality measured in one specific dimension, which is across people with different levels of schooling. And so this is a picture of the premium, that is the extra earnings on average somebody has if they have a college degree, that is a bachelor's degree, that's the red line, or a graduate degree, which is the green line. And economists really got focused in on what we call the returns to schooling or returns to education, 
back in the 1960s with people like Gary Becker, Jacob Mincer, and those guys working on exactly this question, how much do, more do you earn if you have more schooling? And they found that the premium for a college degree was about 40% over a high school graduate, and a premium for having a graduate degree was about 60% over a college graduate. If you follow what happened over time, we actually saw that over the 1970s, there was a decline in those premiums. That is, the extra earnings you got for being a college graduate or a graduate school graduate actually declined so that it reached its low right about 1980. 1979 or 1980 was about the low. The premium from a college degree had gone from about 40% down to the low 20s. Okay? And the premium for a graduate degree declined, declined from 60% to the mid 40s. There was, a, there was an economist from Harvard at the time, uh, Richard Freeman, who wrote a well-known book who's called The Overeducated American, talking about how Americans have become overeducated. And the evidence, one of the pieces of evidence he used, that there was a declining premium for having a college degree. It wasn't worth what it once was in terms of the extra earning power you gain. As soon as he wrote the book, of course, things turned around. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, he joins a lot of famous people in history who've had the ability to do that. And from, a, from the late 1970s until the early 2000s, the premium for a college degree gradually rose until it got up into the mid-70s. So not only recovered all of its decline, but it was more than almost like triple what it was in the late 70s. So there's been this enormous expansion in the premium for a college degree Premium for a graduate degree did a very similar path, obviously in proportionate terms, going from the mid 40s up to like 140%. And in fact, you can see these two stories really are the same story. If I index them, sort of measure them relative, sort of proportional to what they were, you can see they basically follow the same pattern. So there's been this strong increase in inequality across education levels that's been happening since about 1980. One thing to note on this picture, however, is that this is not a story of what's happened in the last decade. It's become a lot more news in the last decade, but most of what's happened on inequality actually happened much earlier. It's just, what we've seen recently is kind of an add-on, if anything, to what we saw earlier. It also is a very different perspective on, 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 on inequality because one way to think about it is, well, college graduates who always earned more than high school graduates now earn even more. But as an economist, what else does this picture tell you? It tells you that the premium out there, what the market is willing to pay for more educated, more skilled individuals is higher today than it's been in the past. The return to investing in skills is higher now than it's been, higher than it was in the 60s, much higher than it was in the 70s, and really at kind of historically high levels, certainly for the last, you know, almost, almost the last century. That is, we have a, a rising premium on education, and I'll show you in a minute, other skills. And what does that mean? It, we we want to say, well, where did that come from? Well, let me go on and tell you part of the other part of the story. If we get away from education and just look at overall inequality, I'll give you a picture. This is track for, this is just for men. I'll show you the graph for women in a minute. I'm going to track what's happened to real wages at the weekly wage, weekly earnings, of men at different percentiles. So think of the green line is the one we hear a lot about. That's the median. That's what happened to the median worker. So the median worker's wage has kind of inched its way up. The 10th percentile worker, the 25th, 75th, 95th, 90th, 95th, as you go up, it's gone up faster. You do the same picture for women, that's the picture for women. So tremendous increase in inequality within men, within women, across all these different percentiles. And if you looked within college graduates, we'd see a widening of the income differentials. If we did it within high school graduates, we'd see the same thing. Now we can put it all together in one picture. This picture has, 
looking at different percentiles of the wage distribution. So this is your high income workers over here, low income workers over here. This is measuring over a 40 year period from 1970 to 2010. So that's 40 years. This is how much measured in change in log. So think about this is like 0.4 over 40 years is like 1% a year. This is the real wage growth experienced by the lowest percentile women. About the lowest percentiles of women gained about 1% a year. The highest percentile women gained over 2.5% a year over that period. If you look within men, the lowest percentiles of men, basically no growth at all in real wages. Highest percentile men, growth of about 1.5% per year, 0.6 over 40 years. Okay. Now what do we learn from looking at this picture? And I think it's a very important lesson. One is you see this curve is basically upward sloping no matter where you look. If you look at the low end, it slopes up, and the middle it slopes up, at the top it slopes up. What does that mean? It means the growth in wages has been higher the higher up in the distribution you are. That's widening inequality. But it also means that this is not a story about just the extremes, right? Look how much growth in equality there's been between the 25th and the 75th percentiles, right? There's been enormous growth within the middle of the distribution. And I, if you've been following the inequality debate over the last, I don't know, this period of time, you've seen a shift in the stories that people would tell. How many people remember the underclass, the discussion of the underclass, right? It was, it was a story that like, oh, all these guys, they're doing okay. There's this one group at the bottom that's kind of isolated from everybody else. They're falling behind. Today we hear the opposite story. It's the super rich. Everybody up here, these are the only guys doing anything. Nothing else going on for anybody else. And the answer is, those, that's not the story of inequality. The story of inequality is one in which there have been widening differentials throughout the distribution. The 80th percentile has done better than the 60th. The 60th done better than the 40th. 40th done better than the 20th. 90th done better than the 80th. Whatever you look, the whole distribution is stretched out. What that means is this is a much more pervasive phenomena than I think we're often led to believe. This is not going to be explained by tax subsidies and boards of directors, what they're doing with the super rich, right? It's not going to explain why there was widening inequality in this range. Welfare programs aren't going to explain why there's widening inequality in this range, right? All these stories that we're led to hear and talk about, they may have some role in some places, but that can't be the overriding story. The overriding story has to be there's something very fundamental going on in the economy that's causing this to happen over this period of time. That we're getting this widening, not just in one spot, but throughout the distribution. All right? So, all right, so where do we go from here? Well, the next thing you can do is you can break it out by time periods, and there you see some interesting things. This is the same picture I had, except for it's broken out in four 10-year periods. The first 10-year period, was the 1970s roughly. Most of the growth in inequality, where this curve slopes up, is in the bottom half. Okay? The, growth, the period that had the greatest growth in inequality was the 1980s, was the widening, biggest widening of inequality, was during the 1980s. And there you see basically throughout, top end was widening, bottom end was widening. The 90s were kind of an interesting decade because you had this kind of what some people call the twist, where in fact the bottom did better than the middle. The middle sort of did the worst in the 90s. That was when the middle sort of fell a little bit behind. Interestingly, the last decade, the one where everybody's talking about growth and inequality, actually is the least. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Now, that's partly because of these, these are cumulative, right? They add together. So the last one is kind of like adding on to all the things that have already happened. So it's bigger news when it kind of widens on top of what's already there. So it's a, little, it's a little interesting. All right, so that's the picture. So that's kind of what's been going on. And again, I think as an economist, I kind of interpret, if I look at the whole period, this is the whole period. Again, this is the percentile. 
This is the growth. What it means, well, what is what I think? Falling relative prices here, rising prices up here. What is it telling you? Growth and demand must be exceeding supply for these people, pushing up their wages. Growth and supply must be outpacing demand, pushing down their wages. So I'm gonna think about this using the basic tools we know in economics, supply and demand, to try to explain what's going on. Okay, before I get there though, I know you're all asking me this question, what about the 1%? Okay, so there's the premium for the 1%. Remember my, my, remember my premium, I'll go back, my premium for college graduates, just to put things in perspective. The premium for a college graduate was 0.4, okay? And it went from 0.4 down to 0.22, and then up to point, you know, almost 0 0.7 something, okay? All right, so that's the premium for a college graduate. What's the premium for being in the top 0.1%? This, I don't even have the 1%, I got the 0.1%, right? These are, these are guys way up there in the income distribution. Well, their premium is 20, okay? That means they, you back here, they earn 20 times what the average guy earned, okay? They are actually earn 21 times, because that's the premium they got, 20 extra. That has gone from 20 up to 70, all right? Now, is that, how does that fit in? Is that much, is that like unexplicable? Well, not really. Because if I put it on my prior chart, which is in proportionate terms, how much has the premium gone up? The college premium tripled, okay? That's the green line, basically went up 200%, that's tripling from where it started, right? Remember, 200% increase is tripling. The college premium tripled. The 0.1% went up more than tripled, but actually the 1% went up less than tripled. So that whole stretching that we've seen also happened at the very top. It's just it started a lot bigger, so when you start stretching, there's a lot more stretching to do. So. It just, it, what I'm telling you is this, that there's been growth in inequality. It's been pretty much throughout the income distribution, not just limited to the top, not just limited to the bottom, but it's been a big phenomenon, something that's really been happening. We see it probably most prominently in education. That's probably the place we've seen the biggest increase, even bigger than on some of the other dimensions. All right. So what generates the growth in demand? So the story I'm going to tell is a story that says there's growth in the demand for more skilled workers, more high talented workers. At the same time, there's also going to be competing growth in supply. And everybody knows how economics works. If demand grows faster than supply, what happens? Prices rise. If supply grows faster than demand, what happens? Prices fall. That's it. That's all we know, and that's all we're going to do. Okay? That very simple story. So let's think about this market. What generates growth and demand for skilled labor? The answer is the same forces that generate economic progress more generally. So where does, so everybody know, where does the economic progress come from? Let me give you a picture of progress. This is progress. Okay? This is a graph. 120 years in the making, running from roughly 1890 to 2012. This is real per capita GDP measured on a log scale. Because I've measured it on a log scale, constant growth rate would be a straight line. This red line is, in fact, the trend line fit to those data. You can see the Great Depression, right? Anybody see the Great Depression? You see it? <laughs> All right, just want to make sure you didn't miss it. You can, you can see the Great Recession, too, OK? Don't get them confused, OK? They're a little different in <laughs> magnitude. There's a little difference, OK? They kind of look similar in shape, but the size is a little different, OK? All right, anyway. But anyway, I'm not going to focus on the fluctuations. I'm a fluctuation. On, I'm focused on this red line. What are we doing? How, what's pushing us up that line? How do we move up that line? Well, where does growth come from? First off, it comes from improvements in technology. Think of my 1890 to 2010, right? We had so many new technologies come into the world over that period of time, right? We had electrification. We had 
the computer revolution. We had the internet revolution. We had, you know, just thing, just new ideas after other. We didn't have cars back at the beginning of this thing, right? That is transportation revolution over that period of time. Now, when you get new technologies, you invest in physical capital. You build new power plants. You build new factories. You build new computer fabs to make computer chips. You build all kinds of new infrastructure. And number three, you invest in human capital. If you look at it, what we did over that period of time is we were increasing the education and skills of our population throughout that 120-year period. And those education and skills help people utilize those new technologies as well as deal with, build and implement those technologies. And a final notion is that the growth in markets, that is markets expanded and as markets grew and expanded, that created also new opportunities. Now, one of the things that we know is that technological progress, investment in physical capital, improved and integrated markets, investment in human capital, all those things lead to growth. All four of those factors are pushing us up that red line. That's what's moving us up that red line. We got better technology, more capital, better markets, more human capital. All four of those are pushing us up those red lines. At the same time though, the first three are all raising the demand for skilled labor relative to unskilled labor. What do those new technologies have done? They've largely displaced low skilled labor and created demand for high skilled labor. Think about the automobile assembly line where we sort of went from a bunch of people doing the physical side of the work to a world in which robots are doing all the work and there are people designing, building, and maintaining the robots, not the same demand for people. Similarly, economists have known for a long time that physical capital tends to be complementary with skilled labor, substitute for unskilled labor. We also know that expanding markets tend to allow the best people to even leverage their talents even more broadly. It's going to be particularly important at the very high end of the distribution where if I'm now a basketball player in a very big world marketplace, I can be like LeBron James and I can earn you know, tens of millions of dollars a year compared to what Oscar Robertson or Will Chamberlain or somebody was able to do in earlier years. Just no comparison. The size of the market has expanded so dramatically. Human capital is the one that goes in the opposite direction. So think about a world in which over time we have that progress that is more technology, more physical capital, more markets, all those things generating more demand for high skilled labor. At the same time, we're producing more high skilled labor. So the, all four forces are moving us up that red line, but there's this tug of war going on between the demand side which is constantly pushing us up the line in the supply side, which is trying to keep the return to human capital in line. So what happens is every decade we get more and more demand for skills. If we produce enough skills to meet that demand, the premium for college and the premium for, edge for skills more generally won't go up. If we produce more skills than the market can absorb, premium will go down. And that's really the story. And it turns out that story fits the data very well. This is a model that Larry Katz and I developed back way back here. We projected out of my sample, pretty good out of sample forecast, right? I only show out of sample forecasts that work. The ones that don't work, I don't show. So, but anyway, that's how it's worked really well. And, and it, but a lot of people have done other things. So this supply demand story seems to fit these data and a lot of other ones. I'm not gonna go into that in two too much detail. So what's really happened is over the 70s, supply grew faster than demand and the premium fell. Since the 70s, supply has grown slower than demand. Demand being driven by those same fundamental forces that have been going on for the last century. And that pushed the premium up. So that brings us to the question, well, why has supply fallen short? Have people not got the message? That is, did they miss the message? And the answer turns out, people didn't miss the message. That's actually an interesting thing. 
That is, if we actually look at the fraction of people who went on to college, that is the fraction of high school graduates who went on to college, I can't even remember which one's which. Oh yeah, the red one is the fraction going on to college. The blue one is the premium for having a college degree that I showed you from before. And look at this. Premium went down, fewer people went. Premium went up, more people went. I don't know what you'd expect, right? So people's response. What's really interesting about this picture is economists recognize the rise in returns to education about here. People had already started responding by the time economists noticed it. Pretty interesting. Tells you what we know, right? <laughs> they were pretty good. Now, so people, it's not like people don't recognize it. People see. People, why do people see this? Because it's important to them, right? People don't pay attention to things that aren't important. They tend to pay attention to things that are important. Not everybody, but enough people that we see the market response. So in fact, more people went on. Well, geez, why did then if things didn't keep pace? Well, the answer turns out, let me just go ahead. This is for men. It turns out while a lot of people went to college, not a lot of them finished. That is, particularly among men, you look at the fraction, this is again, the, the blue line is the return, so that return's going up. The fraction who got some college skyrocketed, but the fraction who actually completed, very little growth, very little response. So what's going on? It means that people are trying to respond, but they're not being successful. That's a big part of the story that what we've had here is rising demand for more skilled workers. Workers have tried to respond by getting more educated, and I assume they're responding on other margins as well, but they haven't been able to keep pace. And as supply falls short of demand, prices rise. Okay. Story for women is a little better. For women, again, you see a much sharper rise among the some college than you do among the completers, but completion rates for women are way up. That's why it's not surprising today that women are much more educated than men in terms of finishing college. Women are much more likely than men. Now, why is that? Why would women be more likely to finish than men? I know you're talking men suck, but that's not, that's, not a good, that's not a good explanation, okay? <laughs> Except for that's what I'm going to say in a minute. But, they, but I got evidence they suck, okay? I got evidence. That's the difference. I don't just think they suck. I got evidence. <laughs> they, they, this is high school GPAs for women and men. Women are better prepared for college. And this is on average. If we were to look at the marginal men, that is the men on the margin of going to college, the gap would be even bigger than it is in terms of the average preparedness for going to college. That's the difference between men and women. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. Women have always done better in school than men in terms of grades. How well do they do when they go to college? This is GPAs in their first, when they start their college. You'll notice that First off, you'll notice that the old C average in most universities isn't alive and well. It's more true here than elsewhere. But, <laughs> you know, so when your kids come home and say, you know, I got a 2.5, I'm above the average. No, you're not. You know, that's, <laughs> average is way over there. But anyway, the, uh, what you do see is that women are much more likely to be in the top categories. Men outnumber women at the bottom. So what is this, what do I think is going on? I think the following. We have this, we have, we have a supply and demand imbalance that's really been the genesis of most of the growth in inequality through in the distribution, I think. That is technology, investments in physical capital, broadening of markets have all contributed to growing demand for human capital. That's not new. That's been going on for decades. What's happened is, is our ability to meet that growth in demand with growing supply 
has really dwindled. And it's not because having poorly educated people is a new thing. We've always had lots of poorly educated people. Problem is, in the past, there was a lot more things for poorly educated people to do, right? As demand perpetually grew over the 20th century, you needed to keep increasing supply. It wasn't a question of whether you're doing as well as you were yesterday. You got to keep doing better to keep pace with the growing demand. And what's happened is we've reached a point where, in fact, our current system is not producing skills at a fast enough rate to keep pace with that growing demand. Now, there's two approaches you could take to try to reduce that problem. One would be to slow down demand. But remember, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Because that's what's pushing us up that red line. The same things that are causing growth and inequality are the same things that are pushing us up that red line. So slowing demand doesn't seem like a very good alternative. The other way to look at the world is to say, look, we're in a situation where the return to having a college degree is triple what it was in 1980. Premium for skills more broadly is much greater than it's been in the past. That's an opportunity to say, look, we have this situation in which if we can increase supply, we're going to get a bigger benefit than we've ever gotten. And that's a more effective way, I would think, to, to lower the growth, and so slow down the growth in inequality. Now, there's also another side to it that I think people don't realize. Let's assume we have a bunch of people that are currently not reaching their full potential because, for example, they're not getting good education K through 12, and therefore they're not really prepared to either get college skills or other skills when they get to the labor market. And one of the things you always have to remember about human capital is it's a cumulative process. That is, the skills you build today build on the skills you already have. So if you fall behind early, it's, harder to, it's hard to catch up. But anyway, let's assume you could improve the educational opportunities for a subset of them, say a third of them. That is, two-thirds, the system's hopeless. You can't help them. But a third of them, you could help. What would that do? Well, first off, that third would get that big return we've been talking about so far. That way, they would be able to capture you know, a much higher return to investment than we've gotten historically in education. That'd be great for them. What would happen to the other guys? Well, the other guys, their wages would rise too. Why would their wage rise? Because there'd be less supply of low-skilled workers, which would push up the wages even for the people who didn't get improved skills by shifting the supply and demand balance. So that kind of has this kind of a broader benefit than you, for them than you would see based simply on the people you help directly. Now, there's a whole other side to inequality that is interesting to me that's happened also. So let me go on. So one of the things that happens when supply doesn't keep pace, we see that prices rise. And then supply starts to respond in other ways. So how does supply respond if you can't produce more college graduates? Well, the existing college graduates work harder and work more. You have too many people in the low-skill categories. They work less. Supply responds on other margins. And that supply response actually exacerbates inequality because you got more hours and more effort for the high-skilled workers who are already earning more and less effort, less hours at the low end where they're already earning less. Unless you think this isn't a big deal, I'll show you a couple pictures. This is hourly, hours per week worked. This is, again, percentiles. This is what it was in 1970 to 72. Basically very flat with higher hours at the very top. By the time we get to 2010 to 2012, 40 years later, dramatically upward sloping, where you have less hours at the bottom, more hours at the top. Everybody sees this. You just look out your window, and you can just see those high-skilled, high-educated workers working hard, working many, many hours, less work going down and down here. That adds to the inequality we already saw, because it's pushing down 
earnings at the low end, raising earnings at the top. That's for men. There's the picture for women. Pretty dramatic. Used to be very flat with somewhat higher hours at the very bottom and somewhat higher hours at the very top. Now it looks like men. Very, very high hours at the top. So the way I think about growing inequality, and I think you can view it in a supply and demand picture. The demand side is really the economic growth engine, which not only makes real incomes rise overall, but constantly raises the demand for high-skilled workers relative to low-skilled workers. That's the history of economic growth. So that demand side, rising demand for high-skilled workers, kind of built into the growth engine. At the same time, you don't have to have inequality growing. Inequality will either grow or decline depending on whether supply grows faster or slower than demand. If you get supply growing fast enough, any, like it did in the 70s, and it did actually through most of the 20th century, we didn't really have rising inequality because supply was growing fast enough. Supply grows more slowly, then prices really start to rise. As prices rise, this kind of effect kicks in, and that exacerbates what's happening with prices. That is, those whose prices are rising work even more, so that even increases their earnings even more. Those whose prices are falling work less, that even increases inequality in that dimension as well. So where do you, what's the policy issue here? I think one of the big problems where we've fallen short is producing skills. And I've talked about the world in terms of education. I don't want to make you think that education is the only skill out there. The answer is education is only one of many skills. But we know that rising premiums is not just about education. It's rising pre premiums within education levels as well. And so why do economists tend to focus on education? Because it's the easiest thing to measure. That's why we focus on it. It's, you know, how many years of schooling you have? Did you graduate from college? Now, anybody who's ever, ever had to hire people realizes there's a lot of difference among the college graduates. It's just it's hard to ask them questions that tells you who's the good ones and who's the bad ones, right? That's, that's why it's hard to hire, because it's hard to know who's good or who's bad even after you talk to them, OK? But education is something we can measure. So I, I don't want you to think education is the whole story. This is really a skill story more broadly. Education is just the one we can focus on and measure the easiest. All right. So that's my presentation. I'm happy to take questions on this, that, or anything else. But so why don't we turn it up to the turn it to the audience for questions? All right. You guys pick. I don't have to pick. You guys pick. Yeah. Hasn't the skill levels required also risen over the century? Yes, absolutely. That's what's going on on the demand side. That is, we've had tremendous growth in the required skill level. I mean, you go back to 1900, the number of people who made their living just as laborers, just as basically providing physical strength, was a substantial part of the labor force. They're basically very, almost nobody today makes their living just by providing physical strength. I mean, that's just declined enormously over that period of time. Uh, you know, so the, the, the requirements required because of technology, because of the capital goods that have displaced, displaced low-skilled labor, because of all those things I was talking about, skill requirements have grown dramatically. And they're continuing to grow, and that's not new. Yeah. Professor, it, it, I think your analysis is pegged to earned income, not income generally, yes? If income generally, let's say, were uh, plotted in the way you've just done, would a more dramatic inequality be shown? And, and is that part of the political debate here, that I, a lot of people are getting a lot of money that they don't earn? I don't think, I mean, if you try to get behind like the big growth in earnings at the top, actually more of it seems to be earned than not. It's a lot of people are private, you know, private businesses, a lot of people in finance. Um, increasing number of people would be business. It's not so much guys cashing checks, right? It's not sort of the Rockefeller kind of phenomena. 
It's actually, Steve Kaplan has some really good work on this and other people have as well. That basically says, even if you focus on those really high income, how, real high income earners, the big growth has been people who start their own business, become very successful, take advantage of growth and demand for the kind of skills they have, entrepreneurial and other skills that are out there. So I would say you've seen some shift from labor to capital, mostly in the last 20 years, but that's not nearly as big a story as the shift toward, you know, skills broadly, not just that, you're not gonna explain that by the college premium. You're gonna explain that by the premium the market can pay today. And I would say a big part of that is the thing we talk the least about, the growth in markets. That is, markets have improved so much today that if I have a good idea and I have talent, money will find me. People will find me through private equity, through all the avenues they have to find you, and they'll help you expand your business. They'll let you go from a local business to a nationwide business much more quickly than somebody could have done it in 1950. I mean, the idea that you had to have your own capital to actually leverage your skills is less true today than it's ever been in the past. And that's a big part of the growth in markets. Thank you for, thank you for the, the presentation. Um, but I'm wondering how college graduates um, struggling to find work fits in with this great demand. They're, they're well, college graduates always struggle to find work. They're just not struggling nearly as badly as high school graduates are to find work. That's, that's a big part of the story. A big part of the story is, remember, it's the return to schooling is not just how great it is to be here. It's how bad it is to be there, right? And that's a big part of the story. No, I, I, I'm not joking in that regard. That is, you know, you really have to compare those two alternatives. Also, remember, there's been tremendous growth in inequality within college and within high school. So the least successful college graduates haven't done that well. But that's always been true. That is, historically, the 25th percentile college graduate earned about what the 75th percentile high school graduate earned. And that's still roughly true. So there's been this expansion in any education premium, but there's still going to be a, it's not a panacea. If you don't have some of the other skills required by the marketplace, you're going to get penalized for that. Over here? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, have the changes in government policies affected the income uh, inequality? Yeah, I think they have some effect. I, you know, I think, I, I think you, I would say in a, one big way, probably, I don't know about changes, the level of policy I think has had a big effect. I think the fact that we give so many people such poor education has had a big effect on inequality. The fact that we, do, we don't have much educational option for many students in many parts of the country is a big part of the story. If we had better K through 12 education for a lot of these people who are trying to go to college and they were better prepared, that would have increased the supply of more skilled workers and would have changed inequality dramatically. So I would say policy on the education dimension, probably the biggest story. You think about things like the minimum wage, things like that that people talk about, around the edges, not, not the biggest deal. Tax policy to some extent has an effect. Lower tax policy, does encourage people at the high end of the income distribution to work harder, to take some of their income in, in income rather than in leisure or other fringe benefit kind of things. Um, so there, there's some effects there, but I would say education policy is the place, that, government policy would have the biggest effect. What's the, uh, what's the policy answer to the men suck problem? <laughs> I, um, well, I, you know, again, it's not, it's not men, when men now suck. They always did, right? They, no, they, no, it's true. It's true. That we're, look, I mean, think about it. We're in a world in which education has become more important. Women have always done better in school than men. 
They're going to benefit more when the, re, when the returns to education goes up. I think if I thought about one of the things that would matter, remember, human capital is not just produced in school. It's also produced at home. I think the household is part of the story. We know the growth in single parent households is a big, is a big deal. Single parent households seems to have a bigger impact on men and boys than it does on girls. So I think that's part of the story. You know, people, to me, people talk about, you know, kind of inheritance and what's gonna happen next in this world. I'll tell you on that dimension, the one that worries me the most, and it's more important for boys than it is for girls, is the inequality in the household experience that are now happening for kids of these people I'm talking about here. And if you look at the amount that the high income, high educated households are investing in their children in terms of time, energy, and effort, compare it to how much other kids are getting invested to them, first off, they're much more likely to have two parents. Those two parents are much more likely to be educated. They spend more time with their kids. Even though they're working all that time, they still spend more time with their kids, not less. That's a, to me, much bigger deal. It's the human capital those kids are going to inherit that's going to be, to me, the source of inequality in the next generation. Whether they inherit some income or wealth or whatever, less important, I think. I think far more important is that inequality story. So, and I think that's a dimension that would help men. The more we could do to support the household, support the family, I think that's going to help men relative to women. And because I think the evidence is pretty strong that bad family outcomes disproportionately affect young boys more than it does girls. Yeah, hello. Um, thank you, uh, Professor. That's an exciting talk. Um, I guess you started touching upon my question just now, um, but I'll be explicit. Uh, where do you place racism and an unequal playing field in your economic framework? I, I, think it, I think it plays a role. I think it plays a role for, for, for it, what's funny is once you put it in this framework, it has a role on not just the people who are of that race, right? I mean, what ends up happening is, you, 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 for example, you go, you give you, inner city people just no option on schooling, right? You give them a terrible schooling. That means they're not going to be as likely to make it out, which hurts them. But it hurts all the other low-skilled people out there in the work of world, too, because now there's just too many people without the requisite skills and low wages. So, I mean, I would say if I'm a minority growing up in the United States, I would big, one of the biggest things I worry about is just how badly I'm treated in terms of schooling. I think it's just really appalling that, that, we, that we don't do a better job educating people equally in this country. And you know, so unfortunately, young kids don't have the option to go shopping. You know, they'd love to come get educated at the high school next to my house, I'm pretty sure. They don't have the option to do that. And I think that's a big problem. Uh, uh, you haven't uh, mentioned anything about uh, outsourcing, Oh. Globalization, free trade, uh, I think, the yeah. effect on inequality. I, you know, I, that, it, you can put that into the same demand story because most of the outsourcing free trade has the similar effect to the, the things I've talked about here, mostly been effectively lowering the demand for less skilled workers, raising the demand for high skilled workers because we mostly particularly if you look historically, imported low-skilled labor in terms of the goods we imported. And so I think it does play a role. I think most people who have tried to measure it would say it's not as big as the forces I put on the board, but it goes in the same direction. Um, what's interesting on the outsourcing dimension is the ability to outsource is moving up the income distribution. We're now able to outsource not just it's like progressively gotten stronger in terms of where you can do it. In the early, like if you go to the 70s, what did we mostly get rid of? Shoes, textiles, very relatively low end, low skilled labor was being hurt by that. You get to the 80s and 90s, it was more middle skill workers were really hurt by the, by the exports. Now you're able to outsource Lots of things, you know, radiology services to, to India, things like that. 
And that's going to increasingly be true, that we'll be able to outsource lots more, call them high-skilled workers, at, at that stage. So I think, if anything, that's going to become a little more equal in the future, probably not than it's been in the past. But it does play a role, because it's tended to reinforce the growth and demand for skilled labor. What role do you see for the community colleges with associate's degrees and certificate programs? You know, I, I, I would say I'm not the world's biggest expert in that area, so I really, I, I don't want to give too tight of prescriptions here. I do say that I will be clear, though, that the, it doesn't mean everything has to become more academically oriented because the market really is rewarding lots of different dimensions of skills. I think there's a big, there's a big potential out there for, um, for you know, vocational type and other types of skill development as well. I think they would be better off focusing there. Um, so I, I think that I think that's a, that's an area where I would see them likely to go. I don't think this idea though that some I think the current policy of sort of saying, well, let's try to subsidize everybody to get a little college. I don't think that fits very well with the, what we've seen. And I've talked to other people who do a lot more work on that area than I do, and they pretty much agree. Because the problem we have isn't that there are too few people getting a little bit of college. I think the biggest problem we have, there are too few people finishing. So, and I would like to see people finish programs generally, whether it's finishing a one, two-year vocational program or finishing a four-year academic program, whatever it is. I think that's the dimension I think I would see our community colleges and college in general go for. Trying to say we got to get more people to really complete the programs to get the mix of skills that they need. That, to me, that's the story. But again, that's a little bit out my area. Yeah, somebody. Is that fine? Is, is, Have you studied the change in the distribution over time? You, can you, in, this takes the actual present distribution, but what if you take the distribution 20 years ago and This is see, 40 years ago versus now. The no, red line that's is- that's the actual 40 years ago and the actual now. Have you uh, measured the, the uh, base year 40 years ago in terms of what it now is so that it reflects the mobility between oh, various percentages. I understand what you're saying. You're saying if I follow the same people over time. Exactly. Now, that, I have done that. I don't have that here. Let me just give you the rough story. That is, if you look at the chance of moving percentile to percentile, it's about what it has always been. So now the consequence of moving from the 25th to the 75th is much bigger than it used to be. But the percentile, the percentile moves aren't so different than they've been in the past. But the consequences are bigger. Hi. Uh, going back to the globalization uh, question, if you were looking at these figures for the world, would we still see as dramatic an increase in inequality? No. No. I mean, that's, the, that's an interesting. Well, and that's because in the world as a whole, the supply and demand balance is pretty different. That is, most of the, the world has been growing in, in total amounts of skills and certainly access to skills. And you would not see nearly the, the growth in inequality. Now, there's also a story that I didn't tell, I, I usually talk about, but I, was, I only had an hour today, so I didn't try to do it. Within the US, male, female. That's the dimension on which inequality shrunk a lot, right? Because of my graph, the women's graph was everywhere above the men's graph, right? When I looked at wage growth, there. I mean, in any percentile, women did better than men. So that what the mention is there's been this narrowing of inequality gender while there's rising inequality within gender. Same is true across countries. That is, if you measure across countries, inequality has been falling. Now, that's a couple of things. One is supply and demand. The other is the integration of markets, right? That is, as the markets get integrated, you're pulling up the low-wage workers and pushing down the high-wage countries. So you got that some narrowing there. But so that's a big effect if you look at world inequality. 
But that, to me, is a different story. I don't usually look at inequality as its end of its own. I look at, and this is, a, I think, a real good lead into what, the way I'm thinking about it. To me, when I see growing inequality in the US, it says to me, the premium for having more skills is higher than it's been in the past. The benefit to us of increasing skills is now much higher than it was in the past. That's true no matter what happened in China. Whether Chinese benefited enormously, whether the Chinese didn't benefit, doesn't matter. The, the implication about what's happening within the US is still the same. That is, the benefits of increasing skills in the US is higher regardless of what happened in China. But a big part of the world story is falling inequality across countries, particularly China and India gaining on the rest of the world. And that's a big, that's a big quanti quantitatively big effect. I don't know. How much time do we have? We're... So we've got four more minutes. So okay. I'm trying to be fair about getting to everybody. I think we're going to be down to the last two questions. Am I on? Uh, I want to know. Uh, what your crystal ball says about the... I lost it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but go ahead. Well, it's just the, the very general question about baby boomers retiring in the next decade and how that would affect the demand side. Um, I, don't know if it, I, I don't know if I put too much in the... I, let me say this. If I'm interested in like this picture, let me go back. Let's go back to where we started. This picture... First thing to remember in your mind is how long it took us to get there, right? It took us 30 to 40 years to get where we are. This is not turning around tomorrow. We're not getting back to here anytime soon. That is, inequality is up. It took 30, 40 years to get to where we're at. It's going to take a long time to get back. So I would say in terms of inequality, I don't see it happening anytime soon. The supply growth response, even if we did everything I talked about, try to increase supply of more skills, it's a very slow process, right? Remember the other, you know, I talked earlier about human capital being cumulative. The other important feature of human capital is it's very durable. It lasts a long time. People, we invest in children today those people are going to be in the labor market, you know, they're, take their 10 years old today, and they're going to work till they're 60. That's 50 years from now. How many assets are we investing in today that are still going to be broadly used 50 years from now? Not that many. Most of the stuff we invest in is going to decline much more. So it's a very slow moving process, which is why it takes so long to get here. But so I would say I don't see like the baby boom retirement as having a big effect on this side of the story. It's important for other things like Medicare, Social Security, all those kinds of issues, probably less important for this one. So if they say one, more, if they say one more in the center of the room, sorry. I'm not all right. the Thank you. I've heard of this thing called the free market. <laughs> and I'm curious, in the real world, how close are we to it? What are the factors that affect us not being in a free market? I, I would say, I would say the place I would get, would get back to is education. Is education a free market? And I would say it varies a lot depending on who you are and where you are. If, and people tend to think about education as like public versus private, but the big difference is competition. I mean, the real question is, does the people that supply my education have to compete with somebody else for their business? That's, what, that's the essence of a market. And why do we have such a good higher education system in this country? You might think we're, I'm making it up because I'm in it, but <laughs> the answer, empirically we do. Better, I mean, just relative to the rest of the world, we do fantastic in terms of higher education. You don't have to, you don't have to vote on that. You can just look at the market, and the market speaks very much. How many people from the US go somewhere else to get educated? How many people come to the US to get educated? Even though it's the most expensive place to get educated in the world, you still get people wanting to come. So pretty clear we do well. Well, we have a lot of competition at that level. We have a lot of really good public education systems. We have a lot of good public schools because they compete against each other and they compete against, they compete against private schools. We have a lot of good elementary and secondary suburban schools. 
because they have to compete against other schools, right? Because if you don't do well, you're not going to keep the students. They're going to move. They're going to go somewhere else. Places that don't do well are places that don't have a market, that really are insulated from competition. So if you want to ask about competition, that would be the biggest one. Uh, is the labor market competitive? Yeah, close enough, I think. There are some places where the labor market lacks competition, but the labor market has gotten more competitive over time, not less. That is, we have a very competitive labor market for most skills, particularly at the high end. That's where all this inequality is coming from. We got people competing to get those workers. So I would say if I said where isn't there competition, I would say in elementary and secondary education. That's where there's the, for some students, there's no competition. For other students, there's lots of competition. And the market shows. And when there is competition, students get much more what they're asking for. And what the parents are asking for, better education. So um, huge thanks to Professor Murphy for his insights on human capital and income inequality. I've been given a little cheat sheet to make some points. And one of them is, speaking of competition in education, is a note that says, hey, don't forget to tell them we're in a capital campaign. <laughs> I'm sure you're hearing this for the first time. Um, trying to uh, uh, raise $4.5 billion to stay competitive uh, and engage over 125 alums. So for me, as an alum, thank you for being here. Thank you for participating. And thank you for supporting the university. I hope you enjoy the rest of Alumni Weekend. Thank you again. <laughs>